Today, we'll get to know the extraordinary life of Lavinia Warren Bump, a woman whose stature may have been small, but whose impact on the world was simply colossal. This captivating journey takes us through the compelling chapters of Lavinia's life, a journey filled with unexpected turns, love, and the relentless pursuit of fame. Mercy Lavinia Warren Bump would eventually rise to unparalleled fame as one of the world's most renowned little people, if not the most famous. However, her journey began on a different note. As a baby, she weighed a substantial and robust nine pounds. It wasn't until a sudden and dramatic halt in her growth that her parents began to suspect that something was amiss. Reports vary, with some suggesting that Warren's growth ceased when she was a toddler, while others point to the age of 10. Nonetheless, what we do know now about her condition is far more comprehensive than what was understood in her time. Warren suffered from proportional dwarfism, attributed to a pituitary gland issue. Fortunately, she did not have to face her challenges alone. Growing up, Warren had several siblings, but only one who could truly relate to her condition. Her younger sister, Minnie, also had proportional dwarfism. In her autobiography, Warren wrote, all my other sisters and brothers were of normal size, leaving her feeling isolated from them, but closer to Minnie. Tragically, however, Minnie would later experience a terrible fate. Even after Warren was diagnosed with dwarfism, her parents continued to hold high expectations for her. They treated her no differently than before, expecting her to carry out her chores. They did provide her with a step stool to reach the kitchen table, although she scarcely needed the leg up. Warren never allowed her dwarfism to limit her ambitions. At the age of 16, she became a school teacher. Standing at only 32 inches in height, she could easily be mistaken for one of her students. While she enjoyed teaching, she recognized that there was a vast world waiting to be explored, and she was determined to explore it all. Then, a rare opportunity came her way. In 19th century America, job opportunities for proportional dwarves were scarce. When one of Warren's cousins, who owned a showboat in Mississippi, offered her a summer opportunity, she couldn't resist. However, there was a catch. Warren's cousin saw the potential in capitalizing on her medical condition and diminutive stature for financial gain. He promoted Warren as the Lilliputian Queen to paying guests on his showboat. Warren danced, sang show tunes, and engaged with awestruck guests. It was during this time that she realized she was a star confined within a small frame. Within her cousin's Museum of Living Wonders, Warren found a community and emerged as the standout performer, even though her fellow wonders towered over her. She formed a close friendship with Sylvia Hardy, a giantess from Maine. They often performed together and shared accommodations as the showboat traveled up and down the river. Warren won the hearts of all the guests who admired her charisma and found her unique condition truly captivating. She became an overnight sensation with money pouring in. She had no desire to return to her ordinary life and asked her cousin to let her stay. Her reputation soon spread far and wide, leading to a fateful encounter with one of the most influential figures in the entertainment industry. In 1862, at the age of 21, Warren transitioned to the big leagues. After spending just a few years on her cousin's showboat, she caught the eye of the renowned impresario P.T. Barnum. Barnum believed that Warren, with her exceptional talents in singing, dancing, and eloquence, would be a flawless addition to his own museum. Barnum's eagerness to have Warren join his American museum led to an invitation for Warren and her family to visit his Connecticut home. During this meeting, the petite performer left a lasting impression on Barnum, who described her as refined, intelligent, and beautiful. He believed she was the epitome of a woman in miniature, and now he only needed to find her perfect match. Barnum already had other proportional dwarves in his employ, including two eligible bachelors, George Washington Morrison Nutt, known as Commodore Nutt, and General Tom Thumb, real name Charles Sherwood Stratton. When Warren agreed to work for Barnum's American Museum, she found herself in the midst of a small but eventful love triangle. Barnum's American Museum in New York provided the perfect platform for Warren to showcase her uniqueness. The renowned impresario adorned Warren with a magnificent wardrobe and expensive jewelry. She rapidly became a sensation among the museum's visitors from all over the country, earning as much as $3,000 per day. Partly due to her youthful appearance, Barnum paired Warren with the teenage Commodore Nutt, Although Nutt was seven years younger than Warren, he was captivated by her from the moment he laid eyes on her. While Warren appreciated being in the company of people like her, she couldn't help but regard Commodore Nutt with indifference. Her heart leaned more towards generals. While Warren cherished her job at Barnum's American Museum, 
Her enthusiasm waned when it came to her show partner. Despite his evident affection for her, Warren considered Commodore Nutt to be nothing more than a nice little boy. However, Barnum hoped to orchestrate a genuine romance between Warren and Nutt for the sake of appearances. If Barnum played the role of matchmaker, he made a clever move by giving Warren a ring. Regrettably, the ring didn't fit her fingers properly, leading the impresario turned Cupid to advise Warren to give the ring to Commodore Nutt. He promised to find her a ring that would fit her properly in due course. What appeared innocent, however, created a significant dilemma for Warren. Warren, without thinking much of it, passed the ill-fitting ring to Commodore Nutt. The infatuated teenager interpreted it as a token of her love. When Nutt tried to express his affections in return, Warren became distressed. She didn't want to hurt his feelings, but couldn't deny her indifference toward him. Fortunately, a general would soon come to her aid. Barnum realized that, despite his matchmaking efforts, Warren had no romantic interest in Commodore Nutt. However, he had no shortage of little people to introduce to her. It was during this time that Warren met the most famous little performer in Barnum's troupe, General Tom Thumb. Unsurprisingly, the Lilliputian Queen and the General hit it off. Shortly after meeting Warren, General Thumb had a private conversation with Barnum. Standing at just 25 inches in height, the diminutive performer made a significant proposal. He urged Barnum to help turn this potential love story into a reality, even offering to let Barnum use their wedding for publicity if everything worked out. It was poised to become the match of the century. Barnum provided Warren with fatherly advice regarding her marital prospects. He emphasized that General Thumb was wealthy, famous, and most importantly, possessed an upright character. Warren needed little persuasion, as she had already developed a fondness for General Thumb. However, her teenage crush, Nut, was unwilling to give her up without a fight. Lavinia Warren and General Thumb's love was evident to all, but while the entire country celebrated the union of these famous little people, one person was not pleased. Commodore Nutt, unable to accept that he had lost Warren's affections, resorted to a backstage fistfight with General Thumb during one of their shows. Warren, however, had unequivocally made her choice. In a last-ditch effort to win Warren's heart, Commodore Nutt attempted to crash one of her dates with General Thumb. Unfortunately for Nutt, he was too late. General Thumb had just proposed to Warren, and she had joyfully accepted. The forthcoming marriage of Warren and General Thumb would become one of the most significant social events of the 19th century. Amidst a nation torn by civil conflict, news of Warren and Thumb's impending nuptials offered the entire country a reason to celebrate. In the weeks leading up to the big day, Warren's miniature wedding dress was displayed in the shop window of designer Madame de Morest, drawing the attention of passersby. Little did anyone anticipate the sensation that the small wedding would create, except perhaps for P.T. Barnum. The momentous day arrived on February 10, 1863. To accommodate the eager public, Warren agreed to hold an open wedding ceremony, allowing anyone to attend. And attend they did. Warren walked down the aisle at Grace Episcopal Church in front of more than 2,000 guests, including numerous 19th century American celebrities. In contrast, the reception was a more intimate affair. Warren hosted her wedding reception at the fashionable Metropolitan Hotel in New York. While she opened the ceremony to the public, Warren allowed Barnum to charge a substantial dollar, 75 admission fee for the reception, which equates to over $2,000 today. Despite the high cost of entry, they still anticipated their guests to shower them with gifts. Warren and her new husband greeted their high-paying reception guests while perched on a grand piano, affording them a grand view of their devoted fans. The New York Times documented the extravagant gifts, including jewelry from Tiffany's, a miniature billiards table, and most notably, a carriage from Queen Victoria. However, one person was seething with jealousy. While Warren celebrated her marriage in grand style, her jilted admirer appeared to be green with envy. The Times reported the next day that during the service, Commodore Nutt seemed ill with jealousy. Nevertheless, it is likely that the Times account was merely gossip, as Nutt served as Thumb's groomsman in the wedding. Warren's later diary entries shed light on the little person love triangle. Throughout her travels, Warren often had to quash rumors that she found troublesome. For promotional purposes, Barnum had circulated photographs of Commodore Nutt proposing to Warren's sister Minnie around the time of Warren's marriage. These images fueled speculation that the love triangle had expanded into a love square. It wasn't until decades later that Warren finally managed to correct a common misunderstanding. In her autobiography published in the New York Tribune Sunday magazine, she debunked the idea that Commodore Nutt had transitioned from being her admirer to her brother-in-law. 
She attributed the confusion to the close, friendly relationship between the four little people but emphasized that there was no romantic involvement between Minnie and Nut. Following their opulent wedding, Warren and Thumb embarked on a whirlwind honeymoon that took them around the world. Their initial stop, however, was right in their homeland. In an effort to divert the nation's attention from the ongoing conflict, then-President Abraham Lincoln invited the celebrity couple to the White House. Upon her visit to the White House, Warren received an unexpectedly warm welcome. President Lincoln leaned in to plant a kiss on her cheek and humorously commented, Sometimes God likes to do funny things. And here you have the long and the short of it, playfully referring to Warren as the short of it. However, Warren didn't hesitate to share her candid opinion with friends, deeming Lincoln's gesture quite rude. A year after their wedding and extensive tour, Warren and General Thumb returned to New York and Barnum's American Museum. To everyone's surprise, they didn't come back empty-handed. The couple made public appearances and posed for pictures, all while holding a mysteriously large baby. The public's curiosity surrounding this new addition to Warren's family reached a fever pitch. Strangely, no one seemed to question whether the baby truly belonged to Warren. What was even more peculiar was that the baby did not appear to have dwarfism. In reality, the baby was not Warren's child. In a stroke of marketing brilliance, Barnum had borrowed the baby from an orphanage. Initially, Warren and Barnum successfully maintained their deception for a few months. However, as time passed, it became apparent that the baby was growing too rapidly for the audience to believe it was Warren's child. That's when Warren devised a brilliant plan of her own. Before embarking on a cross-country tour, Warren devised a bold, if somewhat Machiavellian scheme. She proposed sending a representative to each town ahead of time. Their mission was to discreetly select an infant from the local orphanage to use as a prop during their show. After a day of sharing the spotlight with Warren, the chosen baby would be returned to the orphanage unharmed. Warren's plan proved to be remarkably successful, ensuring a steady supply of infant props for their traveling troupe. This approach allowed them to maintain appearances without the added complexity of traveling with a child. Yet there are darker theories regarding the origin of these mysterious babies. Various sources propose different theories about the origin of the baby, or babies, in Warren's photos. Some maintain that Warren and Barnum sourced the babies from local orphanages, which is the likeliest version of events. However, other sources tell a more tragic story, supported by compelling evidence. One theory suggests that Warren and Thumb did have a child of their own. However, their alleged baby lacked the natural charm and photogenic qualities needed for stardom. According to this theory, they simply substituted their own child in the photographs with more photogenic babies. But an even darker theory persists, the tragic loss theory. According to one source, the baby in Warren's early photographs was indeed their own. Allegedly, they replaced the baby after a few years, not because the child lacked cuteness, but because they had tragically passed away at a very young age. This theory gains credibility from some sources. Warren's deep affection for children coexisted with an unshakable fear of experiencing motherhood herself. Her tiny physique and proportional dwarfism made her apprehensive about the physical toll childbirth might take on her, especially if she were to give birth to a normally sized baby. Tragically, her sister Minnie's experience validated her concerns. Warren's younger sister Minnie had also married another little person employed by Barnum, Major Edward Newell. Minnie became pregnant and carried the baby to full term, but the birth of a full-sized baby proved overwhelming for her, resulting in both her and the baby's untimely passing. Warren held her sister in her arms as she took her final breaths, a devastating experience that reinforced her fears. Throughout her career, Warren expressed her discomfort with the way her fans treated her due to her size. Many struggled to believe she was a grown woman and often behaved inappropriately by wanting to pet and hold her as if she were still a child. Her diaries reveal her discomfort with such unwarranted familiarity. Despite her reservations, Warren and Thumb embarked on a global tour and amassed a considerable fortune. Their journey took them as far as Japan, China, Australia, Egypt, and India, where the King of Benares attempted to gift them an elephant. On November 25, 1919, Warren passed away at the age of 78. As per her wishes, she was laid to rest beside Thumb, her first husband, and the love of her life. However, while Thumb's tombstone was an imposing obelisk crowned by a life-sized, though small, statue of him. Warren's resting place bears a simple gravestone that reads, His Wife. Lavinia Warren's dwarfism brought her fame and fortune, but it also subjected her to constant public perception as either a child or an attraction. Nevertheless, she never regretted her decision to join Barnum and capitalize on her small stature. She once responded to inquiries about her public life by saying, 
When asked if I don't get tired of this public life, I am wont to answer that in a sense I belong to the public.